My name is Joe Foley, and I'm here to uh, take the last hour of your time before the drinks. You know, uh, there's a, it's a famous saying that uh, there are three difficult, thing, difficult things in life. One is climbing a rock that is leaning towards you. Another one is kissing a girl that is leaning away from you. The third one is standing with you between the crowd and the reception of the drinks. And I'm that guy today, okay? Now, my, my talk is about SMAC, social mobility, analytics and cloud, and how this is changing, uh, reshaping the way we do testing and QA. Now, my talk is based on the work that has been done by some of my colleagues, much smarter than myself, and they have actually uh, written a book on this. I'm going to give them uh, an ad for that towards the end of my, my speech. Uh, I'm going to try to do this talk a bit differently. Uh, so, I know it's been a long day, many sessions, a lot of input, a lot of inspiration. I'll try to engage you. So, in case you're thinking, hey, I'm going to relax here, I'm going to have a cup of coffee, well, you're going to be disappointed. All right? Uh, I'm going to start with a, a small story. Uh, I travel a lot. Yes, I'm, I'm a I work for Cognizant, big global company, uh, manage different engagement in different places, and I think to travel. Uh, uh, about a year back, I was going from Copenhagen, where I'm based, to, to Oslo. And I was sitting on a plane, and the plane started to accelerate on the runway, as it should, you know, before taking off. And it was going very fast, and then suddenly the brakes were hit, and you, we were all the passengers, we got this shock of, you know, the deceleration, we were sitting with, with our hearts in our throats and thinking, what's happening? And then the captain, in a, in a very slow and gentle voice, says, uh, be calm, uh, one of our subsystems didn't respond in time, and it's a normal practice that the main engine will not take off and the brakes will be hit automatically, so it's like a full safe kind of mechanism. Now, what this was saying was that uh, I said, unfortunately, I cannot de engage the brakes, so we need to go back to the, to, the, to, the, to the gates. And we went back to the gates, and then they called an expert in. So this guy came in with, with a bag, equipment, so taking up a lot of wires, doing a lot of stuff. And I was sitting together with some of the other IT folks there looking at each other. Saying, Let's see what this action, this, this expert it does in action. And after a few minutes, uh, he says over the speakers, uh, I'm gonna power off the plane and turn it off again, turn it on again afterwards. And I was sitting together with some of the other IT folks looking at each other and said, This guy is rebooting the plane. Yeah? <laughs> We're thinking, I'm sitting in this advanced Airbus 321, there's an issue, and his solution to the IT problem is let's reboot the plane. So, by the way, it didn't work, so we had to get off the plane and take another one. So, this is just take it back to basics. So today I'm going to take some of, talk about some of the advanced stuff about social mobility, mobility on the next cloud. But sometimes these accidents and these incidents remind you of some going back to basics. All right. Uh, if you look at uh, you know what has happened the past 10, 10 years or so, we have gone through an era of head scratching. You probably all heard about the uh, financial crisis. You've seen some of our, the, the global leaders sitting together, scratching their heads. Even Poland to a certain extent. I know this last one is a bit... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm cheating here because she's actually not scratching her head, but she's also new at the job. Yeah. The point is, all these leaders were, were wondering that something strange is happening. Imagine that you'd be sitting at the board of directors at Kodak 10 years back, and someone would tell you, in 10 years' time, 
people will be taking 10 times as many photographs as they do today. Is that good or bad news? Excellent. Imagine if you were told that the number of book sales, or pe number of people reading books will increase 25% and you're a book publisher. Is that good or bad news? What happened? Kodak, the world leading Kodak moment, producer of, of the camera related photograph, photography equipment company collapsed. Yet people are taking more photographs than ever. Some examples based on the US as well, Los Angeles Times were backgrounds. New Orleans Times again only started publishing three, day, three days a week. People are watching more movies than ever. Yet Blockbuster is bankrupt. I think the only place where it's still surviving is in Denmark actually. They have small for some reason they're still you know, trying to fight for their survival. Book sales increased by 25, 27% in 2014. Yet Borders, one of the biggest bookstores, collapsed. So what's happening? Strange, isn't it? It seems to me like a contradiction. We've seen this in the past, haven't we? You know, with, with each technological, technological shift, some companies will adapt to new technology, adopt new technology, and come up as new winners, while others will collapse. This is also happening now. And I think you know, you've seen some examples, you probably know forget most of those. I remember, as mentioned myself, I travel a lot. Uh, I remember each time I used to land, you were sitting in a flight, the plane, you'll click off, you know, the mobile, switch it on, and you hear the Dr. Jane coming on. Yeah? You don't hear it anymore. So what happened? It's a bit strange, isn't it? What's happening is that the technology's shift is happening that quickly that these companies are not able to rewire their business model to fit the new technology. Now this is transforming businesses, basically new business models are being created as a result of the technology shift. It's also transforming the way we live, we interact with human beings in society. If you look at the traditional way we own as companies, organizations, societies, we've had even systems, IT systems, we had this very monolithic silent approach. We have different divisions, different silos, each with their own responsibilities, managing their own job. What is happening now is that basically this is going like from Someone's trying to connect to me. A good example of you know new technology. It's like going from, from solid to liquid to gas. Things are getting decoupled. Things are getting globalized. And things are getting more independent. Now the cornerstones of this transformation is the so-called smack stack. What's that? Social computing, mobility, advanced analytics, and cloud. And it's the sum of all these factors together that is generating, generating these, these new business models. This is creating a new wave of uh, commodities, IT commodities, that we're getting as consumers. Now, let me show an example. Now, just the first half of my talk, I will not address testing, so please, you know, be patient. I'll get to testing at some point. Uh, I'm looking at more from a technology and a business point. This is an event that happened 2005, and this is an event that happened in the same place 2013. Anyone can guess where this uh, this is? You're nodding your head. I know. 
You know the picture? The Vatican. The first one is taking actually the election of uh, Pope uh, Benedict XVI. Uh, the last one is, is the Pope uh, Francis XVI. Look at the level of adaptation of the new technology. Interesting, isn't it? This is in the span of, of eight years. Quite interesting that people, instead of being there, they're busy documenting that they're there, but that's a different kind of story. You know, technology also you know, changed the way we interact and socialize. Famous quote by Bill Gates is that uh, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next few years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. This is a clear example of this. Now, if you look at it again from a technology point of view, we've seen a number of uh, revolutions of technology shifts that have happened throughout, throughout you know, history. Uh, we had mainframes back in the 60s and 70s, and then we have a transition to, uh, to what? mini computers. Then the third wave came uh, in the 90s, uh, moving into uh, desktop internet, and now the mobile internet of things and mobile internet. And what we see is an explosion of devices, explosion of units that are connected to the internet. I was trying to, you know, see whether it's true. It says 10 billion devices plus. And I thought it can't be true. I mean, we're only like 7 billion people in the world. But I started, you know, counting how many smart devices could use. I have myself at home. I have, you know, I have two, three laptops. I have a mobile phone. I have a car that is connected to the internet. I have, uh, I was, you know, at IKEA last week and I saw this brochure sure where you can get a connected carpet. God knows what it's connected to, but it's connected and go to the internet. So the number is, is exploding. We are now here, and this is actually where we see something interesting happen from a testing point. We have this series of S curves, and it's the uh, with the decline of an S curve and the emergence of the second one, this is where the interesting things might happen. First significant change is data. Analysts will say that data management increased about 50 times within nine years. Number of high professionals only increased by 1.5. It means that we need to manage more data. Let's try to think of it from a testing point of view, how much test data you need to manage, and the kind of combinations and applications you need to test. We'll get back to that. Eighty-three point eight exabytes. That's the monthly traffic, monthly traffic uh, towards the end of 2015. Now, an exabyte. It's uh, I'm not a smart guy, so an exabyte. I looked it up. It's one with 18 zeros, a very big number. You know, it's uh, like the Fatisillion, if you've read you know, Donald Duck comic books. It's a very, very big number. And it's worth of 50,000 years of TV worth quality video coming out on the internet each and every month. Now, what's interesting is that 90% of all the data that we have in the internet has been created in the last two years. This is exploding. All right. What does it mean? The new companies that we saw before, their speciality is tapping into that data. In Cognizant, we, term, we coined the term code halos. What does it mean? With each like, dislike, search, deposit, jar, click that you make on the internet, you're leaving your digital fingerprint. And this is, it's that digital fingerprint that these companies would like to get hold of. I think you probably also have the experience that when you go, for example, to uh, Netflix, if you go to Google, uh, Amazon, iTunes, you feel that they're reading your mind, don't, don't they? You, you, you put in like two movie, uh, two movie titles and they'll come in suggestions to you. And in which case you say, yeah, it's a good suggestion. And the thing is, the more you enter, the more you use the, their apps, 
the more accurate it gets. This is what it's called, what we call cold hail. What is really interesting is when we start connecting all these dots. When you use Facebook, Amazon, Google, Netflix, and these other apps, and you start basically creating a pattern, patterns and using analytics to discover your patterns and users' passion on the internet. Let me give you an example. How many of you are using iTunes? Spotify. All right. Do you think, just by looking at your musical preferences, the playlist, people can tell something about you as a person? Yes. Yes. So this is taking again uh, analysis from the U.S. Ninety percent of golf pro fans of the Bold Republic. To replace this over the trunk, you know, that gets. Uh, if you like Madonna, 90% is the chance that you will vote Democrat. Okay? Let's give it. I think if you do some analysis to, to vote in here and find some equivalent to that. Let me give you some other musical correlations that might be very interesting. Any Justin Timberlake fans here? You don't want to admit it. <laughs> Chances are, if you like Justin Timberlake, you like Pixar Bills. Yeah? Thank you to turn on one. Any Jimmy Hendrix fans here? Okay. What? Well, like the fact that you, you want to admit that you like <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix, but you, not Justin Timberlake. If you like Jimmy Hendrix, chances are that you like science fiction. I know this is kind of flawed and not generalizing here, but the point is this is where we, you know, these companies are trying to connect the dots between your habits. Another interesting thing, by looking at your playlist, people can figure out whether you're in a relationship, you're married, uh, divorced, thinking of getting divorced, thinking of an affair, just by reading and analyzing your playlist. They can figure out your age. Most of us, you know, I found myself going to the band. I, I, grew, I was grown up in the 80s, so I always found myself going back listening to the Pitch Mode and Duran and these, you know, YouTube and, you know, brought up with, with these, these bands. And, and I think the interesting thing is, that, you know, you make your musical preferences in the age of 15 to 25. And you cannot tend, tend to stick to that. So by looking at your, your playlist, they can figure out what age you are. Family background, whether you're coming from the countryside, coming from the suburbs, or you're coming from a very urban kind of family. All this by looking at your playlist. It's about your IQ. How's that? Well, by looking at your, the other data you're posting on the internet, for example, where you're taking the education, what kind of college you're playing, uh, you can look at it. They can look at you know what are the success ratio at these colleges and try you know create a correlation. In a website actually they've tried this exercise. I don't know if you've seen that. It's called music that makes you dumb.com. If you go there, you can look at actually the IQ and or the, the intelligence level and the band of the music stage. I was uh, I have a daughter who is uh, they did it by actually looking at uh, people's universities and looking at the, the average score at these universities and correlated back to the, to the music test. Now, I've, I've got a daughter, she's, she's, uh, she's a teenager, and uh, to my horror, I was passing you know, uh, by her, uh, her room and I, I heard she was listening to Beyonce. And I, I looked it up here. I said, oh God, you know, her future is, is gone and she's doomed, you know, she's doomed. <laughs> so, so I went to, to, to my, you know, my stack of records, took a stack of, you know, Bob Dylan and U2, looking up over here, and gave it to her. I said, listen, listen to these, they're good for your future. 
And she just looked at me and said, CDs? Who oh, listen to CDs? I don't even have a CD player. Yeah. All right. Now this is also getting amplified by some new gadgets like wearable devices. We all got, for example, our garments and our Fitbits, and what you call them. We got our Google Glasses and so forth. Now the interesting thing starts happening when the analytics driven by these applications are fit back organizations where they can sell you more, more products that will fit exactly your needs. So the idea behind that from a business point of view is to of course sell more products by exactly knowing your habits and your needs. So how is this affecting testing? Let's look at that. By the way, how many of you are on uh, LinkedIn? Facebook? Okay. All right. <laughs> As mentioned, the fabric behind uh, these new companies is SMAP, Social Mobility Analytics and Cloud. Uh, so let me ask you, how do you test SMAP? How do you test social mobility of Linux cloud? Any views? What's the best method? Count testing. Crowd testing. That's a good one. Other options?
Customer. How's that? Sorry? They set the deadlines. They set the deadlines. The customer coming in and saying, hey, you need to release tomorrow. Okay, interesting. Other views? In the good old days, our managers used to determine that. Say, okay, I'm going to release once a year, you know, every quarter, or every second year. And it's determined by, you know, we can mark the mechanism, we analyze that, and post release whenever we think it's suitable. What's happening now is, is that there's a new iPhone coming out to the market next month. The new version of Lollipop is hitting at the end of my in two months from now. Samsung is releasing the device. So, what's happening now is that the release schedule is no longer determined by us. Is determined by external factors. This can be frustrating. It's the reality. Reality is that, from a deployability point of view, you're at the mercy of the App Store and the Google Play, and it's for you. It's very important that the user has good access to those apps, can download them, have a good experience getting the, getting these apps whenever they need them. Second level is functionality, obviously still there, but what's interesting is that if you think about the most successful apps, the functional layer is getting thinner. The most successful app, for example, in Denmark is Mobile Pay, and as the name suggests, it has one single functionality, it's transferring money from one device to another. So if you think about it, the functional challenge is getting Thinner. It's easy to cope with, still needed, but it's getting small. What's getting more important is the interoperability. Your app will be connected, will be on a device, probably with connections to other apps, to other devices. Then there's an increasing layer of non functional aspects. Where security, of course, would be one of the most important ones. I think you know those who went to the next session can recognize this. Other aspects would be non-functional aspects such as resilience, performance, and so forth. Last but not least, of course, you want your app to be useful for customers. Ultimately, you want them to like your app, so it can feedback the first deploy to go deploy the layer, so you can have people going there and getting more of. of uh, Recommending us to get more apps from your app store. Find myself going back to the old definition of usability. The effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction with which a specified set of users can achieve a specified set of tasks in a particular environment. This go back to 1998. Uh, Very old definition is still valid. So ultimately, you want your app to make the life easier for the users of here. By the way, there are a few other attempts of, of looking at uh, the user experience hierarchy. I think uh, I've come across a few, and uh, uh, I'm a part of a so-called uh, testing retreat where we sit together and discuss some of these topics, and I think that was one of the topics that popped up last year, and uh, I think Yannick presented his view on that. Uh, one of the tools that companies are using to get that insight whether an app is useful or not is by so-called social listening. What do we mean by that? These tools are actually from a testing point of view. The interesting aspect here is that these are coming from marketing, which is a new dimension that probably we have not seen before in testing. But the idea is to listen to what the users are saying on the social media on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, analyze the information there and feed it back to the organization. This is basically all about looking at the code halo of your users and uh, analyzing those to identify, first of all, requirements, new needs, detecting areas that you need to focus on, from a testing point of view. Applying a risk-based approach, 
optimizing your coverage. I've just been to the session with, with Dart before and I had, I had a saying optimizing your test coverage and then we realized that the test coverage doesn't mean a thing. It's basically the requirement coverage, the screen coverage, user profile coverage and so forth. Last but not least, getting everything back on the quality in use by the end users. What do I mean by that? Think, you know, 10 years back, how did you identify requirements? You, sir? You asked. Who did you ask? And how did you ask the customer? Yes. Typically, and again, I'm speaking from my own experience, requirements were coming from the marketing department, actually. They were actually interviewing the customers, inviting a few focus group in, trying to identify what are the needs, and based on that, you have a requirement specification, and then the requirement specification was, you know, you create a detailed design, and design was created, you know, created the coding, then you created, you know, the, the unit testing based on that, the integration testing, and so forth. You know the story. Now, have you ever played Chinese whispers? You know this game? Basically, I'll be whispering something in your ear. You do the same thing. Yeah? And at the end, you probably don't realize what I was saying initially. Yeah? Now, think of that as an analogy. We used to do this before. You know, actually, marketing department were whispering in the ears of the lead architect, was whispering in the ears of the lead developer, and so forth. And the kind of the message was getting diluted each time. Now we have a golden opportunity to tap the information directly from the source using social listening, using analytics. We can just go directly and see how our customers are using our, our apps and get the information from there. Risk-based testing. How many of you are using risk-based testing? Let's see if you ask. How do you, what is the, what, what are the best practices? How are you conducting risk-based testing? Gentlemen in the back. How are you conducting risk-based testing? Risk. Usually, you ask, yeah. If you ask and assess what will be the most important thing to the assessors. So we need to collect the opinions from the management, from the customers, and from our experience. But that is our opinion, and I because I can afford it. All right. You're right. I did. I used to create and do a risk analysis myself. Uh, of course, most of us are applying risk-based testing, you know, in one way or the other. I used to uh, use two criteria. One is, you know, business impact, another one is likelihood. Business impact, you know, what will happen if it fails, another one is what is the likelihood of failing. I used to basically base, you know, create my best guess, identify what is the most important thing, maybe I'll engage with a business user and identify these are the important areas. And then I'll talk to the technical guys, the developers, the developers, and then what are the vulnerable, what are the chances of things going wrong. And based on that, I'll create my risk analysis. Now, what's interesting is that, we often saw that when a product gets out in the market, not always the reality obeys with my risk analysis. Yeah? You get surprises. Something that you have maybe, you know, guessed it would be high risk, it turns to be low risk, and vice versa. Here, through analytics, you're able to get much better information because you're tapping again directly from the users. Another thing is, users are, are brutally honest. If you like your app, you get the thumbs up, you get the nice tweets, you get all the feedback directly on the internet. The things are, you know, if you don't like your application, you can also get information immediately from the users. How to use this, I'll get back to this in a while. Now, from a testing point of view, There are three areas I want to focus on. I will not cover all of them. Same level deep. One of them is, of course, involving end users. As mentioned before, the best way you mentioned yourself of testing SMAC is using SMAC. So if I want to test, for example, some the way users are using a certain app, I can use Crowd to test that. One of the ways of achieving this is using, for example, hallway testing. 
some of these aspects might be different. But over testing is about passing in a hallway and meeting by a random certain person that you would ask his opinion for. Another example using A-B testing, multivariate testing, I'll, I'll show an example for that. Or gamification. Have you ever seen a very silly game on Facebook where, you know, asking you, what is your favorite color? I know the answer, it's blue, it's blue, you know, and you press that, and you know, of course it's right. Uh, you can enter a prize, win a prize. What actually are you doing? You're doing some performance testing for an app. So actually, this approach is all about pushing your testing to your end users, letting them do your testing. Let me give an example of, uh, I'll not give a couple of those, but let me give an example of the AB uh, multivariate testing. AB testing basically is about dividing, for example, this audience in two categories and sending two versions of the app out to the market. This part of the audience will be testing one part, of it, one version. The other part of the uh, audience will be testing another version. What we'll do at the end, we'll compare where you get the highest conversion rate, where it's most successful, and adapt the one that is most successful. Again, I'm passing on testing to the end user. Uh, a different variation of this is called uh, multivariate testing, where you actually uh, change a number of variations at the same time. And based on the response, again, from analytics and advanced analytics, you're analyzing all these data, and enable you to make one decision about what is the best kind of, uh, uh, what is the best set of features, what are the best, you know, uh, variations that you want in your app. By the way, anyone using this, these techniques? Maybe not yet. Another maybe I'll just cover a, uh, Last, last, last one of, of, of the user uh, and user involvement is, is so-called RAM uh, development testing. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, we did some testing for LinkedIn some year back, and the way they do it there is, is uh, quite simple. They will isolate part of the user community and just release out to an isolated area. It can be one country, or it can be a number of uh, number of users in a certain geography or can be actually across different locations. Monitor the use. If it works, then they roll down to other geographies. If it doesn't, roll it back. So basically, this is testing directly in production. I remember in my old days, um, my manager used to tell me, you should never test in production. It's not allowed. And you know, I never understood, you know, why. Obviously, things can go wrong, yes. This is actually testing in production. You're setting it out, seeing the response, and based on that, you can make a wise decision whether you roll it out to the entire community or go, go, go back to the previous version. Obviously, the non functional aspects are getting increasingly, increasingly important. And, uh, we had a dedicated session today on security. Uh, I'll not go through all these aspects here. Uh, one I want to mention is, is again back to referring to DOS session before uh, monkey testing. What's monkey testing? Monkey testing is about testing things in random, random institutional tests. In my previous company, I used to uh, use monkey testing to test medical devices with one purpose, is just looking at the resilience and, and uh, reliability of the application, just bombarding it with a different kind of random input and seeing how long does it take for it before it breaks. And looking at, you know, basically the number of random operations to failure. And I thought, you know, this method was gone back in the late 90s because it was using it now. Guess what? Is it coming back now? Netflix had a couple of years back a serious issue. Uh, they had a, one of the servers 
broke down, and as a result, they had um, uh, Netflix, it's high, Netflix went down for two to three hours. Now, for a company such as Netflix, this is, we're talking about billions of dollars just in the cost of two to three hours. As a result of that, they issued a number of monkeys. One of them is called Simian Monkey. Actually, basically, the idea is looking at the results. The idea is looking at the different vulnerabilities that they have in the system in production and looking at how are the backup and recovery systems taking over and doing what they should do. The whole idea is about basically baking the user's pattern. Now, back to, uh, again, those of you who have been here for God's session before, we, we, you know, we talked a lot about regression testing. Regression testing, as you know, is going, repeating the same test again and again to make sure that what used to work yesterday still works today. Now, imagine that this is a minefield here, yeah? and I want to get across this minefield. What is, the, what is the best way for me to get through the minefield without getting blown to pieces? Any ideas from the audience? Yeah. Well, let's assume that I need to go through it. <laughs> so I would say anyone to want to volunteer to make the first run through the minefield, yeah? And let's say, okay, Jacob, can you please, you know, <laughs> get you... Uh, Hundred thirty. If you make it through, you know um, what I will do. Then I will take, you know, walk in your footsteps. This is what we're doing in regression testing. We're taking the same path over and over again to the same minefield. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do regression testing. I'm just pointing to the fact that there are some elements that you would not discover by just doing regression testing. The whole dynamicness of doing random testing is not there. That's correct. Pesticide paradox, basically. Uh, the more you do the same thing over and over again, the less you, you the chance you are you will find some, you know, stumble across new, uh, a new defects. Uh, obviously, there's the whole business-centric element of the whole thing. Social listening is, is being one of them. Other aspects are, for example, modeling the business processes, including the compliance aspect. Getting close to the business using these approaches. Exploratory testing, of course, is still there. Now, the new element, the exploratory testing, is actually how to use, how to do exploratory testing utilizing your end users. And post-production testing. We had, uh, not to start, you know, uh, advertising for, for, for companies in our company, but companies are big companies. We have 35,000 testers in the company, which is quite a big company. And uh, the whole smack way that is, is changing the businesses is also changing, transforming the way companies and organize the kind of services we're providing. We were approached by one customer, one, a bank, who asked us, hey, Colin, you have so many people, we want to launch this app in a couple of weeks from now. We don't want to read about in the papers that, you know, Basically, uh, it failed, users were unsatisfied with it. Can you use your crowds across the globe to do testing of that app? Which for us, we, didn't, we have never tried to do it this way. And the kind of model we applied there was also quite different. We said, okay, instead of paying us by the number of hours we use for testing, you pay us for the number of defects we find in your app. So the point is, again, the whole smack stack is also changing the way we do testing and the way we can ensure the end-to-end -end quality of our applications, harness the power of the crowd. From a testing point of view, I believe we are, again, beginning a new S-curve. This is why I believe we, you know, we are getting into a new era of digital testing. And if you look at basically the traditional role of testing, is where we see the change. We have a, a shift up in terms of getting closer to, uh, to the user. This is where basically the whole business insurance comes in, uh, the business process modeling, end user experience, and so forth. We have a shift left in terms of getting
getting early involved in the, in the development life cycle. We have, we have seen in the past, I mean, this has been known for quite a long time, you know, involved in requirement analysis, uh, uh, static analysis, perform engineering as early as possible the life cycle. We have a shift left, shift right from an operations point of view, we're getting closer to, uh, to the ops guys, the whole DevOps, continuous integration, delivery quality. And we have a shift down, basically we're working closely with developers, helping do white box testing, TDD, dynamic analysis and so forth. What does it mean? So we're doing a shift up, shift down, shift left, and shift right. Does it mean that we are shifting out as testers? This is basically the transformation we're going through. So I believe that this is, you know, provides a new opportunity for all of us to rethink, you know, uh, if we were focusing on the traditional functional testing, is the place I want to be? Or do I need to look at how I can add a shift right, shift, shift right, shift right, uh, shift up and down? Other aspects are becoming, you know, uh, increasingly important, or, you know, the whole testing as a service test. Let me give you an example. Uh, ten years back, I was involved in, in, a, in a big project of working, developing medical devices, and uh, we wanted to, uh, to increase the level of automation, so we had to order some equipment for, for automation. And I remember that I needed a server for, basically, for my, my automation tool. Now, back then, this process took me about six weeks. First, I need to say, raise a request in some kind of system. I think it was a paper form at the time. It was then sent to my manager, who approved that, and sent it to his manager, who approved that, and then it was sent to someone in the IT department who ordered the equipment, or, uh, sorry, procurement, ordered equipment, and then it came back. Six weeks later, I had the equipment I could start using. Nowadays, we talk about environments, you can get them on demand. There's this website called Test Chameleon, this German company, uh, testchameleon.com. Have you been there? Have you seen it? You, you can get a environment within five minutes. So if you have five machines, you can get them in the cloud, deploy your automation code, do all the testing, and get the results back. This is for me perfect example of the new capabilities that I'm getting from the SMAC and testing, cloud solutions. And it's all about the user and user experience, how you can envision the whole thing through the eyes of the user. Now, what, what is happening again from an IP point of view, I was just talking to, uh, to the general there just in the break before, uh, discussing that in the old days, the center of power in IT was revolving around the CIO, yes? The CIO was a very powerful person. So guess what's happening now? The power structure is changing. And you, the person in power in charge now in the organization, is the CMO, the chief marketing officer. These are coming, basically these are most impacted by SMAC, and these are coming with the new requirements for faster agility, whole end governing the end user experience and so forth. So looking at looking at it from a testing and QA point of view, I think most of you of us have been through the whole playbook that we used to focus on finding defects. I mean, was still important, but you know, uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. So just from the list some of the aspects we were focusing a lot on before. Um, we were doing a lot of activity based, you know, we had these distinct siloed approaches that we discussed before. We have a testing team, then we have a development team, then we have a business team, which of course now is falling apart. Uh, we have, we were constrained by the hardware. Testing was a lot, you know, manual, uh, a lot about requirement, performing requirements. 
And then we need to live with the fact that we were pursuing by the skills we have within the whole teams. What is happening now is basically, it's more about identifying patterns using, as mentioned, analytics to enable us to look at how users are deploying using their apps in production to enable us to prevent new issues from, ha from, from happening and from creating more intelligent tests. It becomes also about more user advocacy, again this is the shift up, virtualization of environments, automation to the highest degree feasible, and again a lot about monitoring user behavior. So our role is, is changing from just confirming requirements to monitoring the end user behavior. Now, there are two ways of looking at it. One way is, is looking at, say, hey, um, this is going to disappear in a few years. Uh, I don't care about this, you know, just, you know, just a fashion thing. A bit like the internet, uh, it's going to be gone in two years. Like, you know, two, two years and it's gone. Uh, we can get scared about the whole thing. Or we can look at the new opportunities it brings. We can look at it at ways of sharpening our skills getting into new directions, shifting up, left, right, down. With these words, come to the end of my talk. I'm going to leave, leave just a few minutes for questions. For silence. Yes.
Yes. Uh, do you think that cluster should become a civil data scientist? Because research is about things that are part of big data information. Uh, I, I don't think we should become scientists, but, but I think that um, the need for applying different tools to help us, for example, analyze and crunch the data that are available, will become high in the future. So obviously, you know, there's a need of, we might not have to say this information or skills ourselves, but of course we need to include that as a part of our cross-functional team, so we have at least someone who has that knowledge or a tool that can help us with processing the data. Uh, but, we, you know, basically the, the, the whole test data management, for example, is, is also becoming a, a big issue. The fact that you are, you know, getting copies of data from production and you need to keep the sensitive information out of the reach of you know, of, of people that shouldn't access it. Uh, so you have the whole data masking. You have even regulations that are increasing within the EU, for example, that they cannot get outside of the European Union. So these, you know, are becoming, you know, uh, increasingly important for all of us. Uh, so I, I'm not answering your question, I know, but, but I think, of course, that, you know, it's a certain level of skills that are needed with respect to handling data and this data that will be increasingly important. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, you had a quite, quite uh, good story uh, about which is still valid from 1989. So maybe this old book will be valid next 20 years still. Uh, there's a saying that. Uh, Predicting is difficult, especially when it comes about you know when it's about the future. Uh, and I don't know how long you know next wave will will, uh, will will last. You know, and what we're seeing is that these waves are getting shorter and shorter. And, and I don't know of course what is the next wave, but but this is <coughs> things is happening now. Um, and whether it's going to last 20 years or 50 or only five, only time will show. Uh, but I'm. I'm I'm just seeing that we are just scratching the surface of the whole thing, so it's going to explode. Uh, it's like the ketchup effect, we've been you know, on it, but this problem and now it's getting out uh, in the open. Other more questions? Okay, uh, then I'd like to thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Uh, there's some additional information out there. Uh, there's a book actually uh, that you can get, it's called Code Halo. Uh, you can either get it in a physical form, but we're talking about Smack, so it's also available actually as an app. And you can get it for free actually uh, on the future of, of work. You can download it on your iPad or your iPhone. Uh, probably just stuff, and there's a website called Seeing Things Different that you also might uh, find uh, interesting. Now, uh, wrapping up, uh, we have a very long day, you know, uh, not for long sessions, had sessions on test improvement, on security, on tools, on people, on skills, and uh, the idea was also to give you a flavor of, you know, basically what, what we think can happen at, at Eurostar. Uh, so, and, and uh, this was, you know, uh, I'm saying this is a roadshow, but actually I would say that Eurostar itself is a roadshow, because typically Eurostar takes place in different parts of the world. Uh, this year it's happening in Sweden, in Stockholm. Uh, myself, I started my uh, I started my career as a tester. I went to my first year start uh, in the year 2000, and I've attended out of the 17 since I've attended 15 out of those 17, and I've spoken at 11 of those. Uh, and for me, it has been uh, uh, not only a source of inspiration, but also a nice place to exchange uh, business cards and ideas with your fellow testers from around the world. So I can only recommend that experience. Thank you.